Hi everyone, you're listening to Guts and Girl Bits. I'm Alison Mitchell, a practicing naturopath, and I hope to share with you all sorts of information about women's health and digestive health to educate and empower you to make informed choices about your own health. Please remember that all information is general and does not replace consulting with a healthcare practitioner. Hey everyone, I'm joined today with Clara Bitcon Bailey and we're going to be talking about elemental eating, which is a really interesting topic. Most people would have probably seen lots of different recommendations for diets out there in the interwebs, but how do you know what's right for you? Well, today, that's what we're going to find out and actually understanding the different characteristics that you have and then the different characteristics that different types of foods and herbs can have can mean that you can actually really individualize and personalize your your eating to get the best health. Thanks so much, Clara. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for such a succinct summary of what is a big topic. (laughs) I imagine it is going to be a bit of a big topic, but we'll do our best. Can you give us a little bit of a bio about yourself and a bit of a background for those who haven't heard of you before? Yeah, so I am, like you, a naturopath and a herbalist. I'm also a fertility awareness educator and I've been in practice six years now and I Um, clinically focus on women's health, people with uteruses health and have a big love for really bringing the or keeping the traditional side of our craft alive and balancing it with all I mean I feel like there's a lot of great voices advocating for the the science side but the these more traditional things not so much so that's like a yeah strong part of what I do and who I am. I love that. And I definitely think that's such an important area to bring back into the world of naturopathy because we are mm-hmm. our, we're our own profession and having that connection to our traditional knowledge and wisdom is really important. And that's mm-hmm. how we've had such success for so many years. So if we're merging into a new paradigm, then it's not going to do anyone any favours in the long run. And I know that I was trained, when I was trained at um, UWS, it had a big, big um, science background and elements. So when I was a new graduate, that was, you know, where my head was at. Whereas the more that I've been practising, the, the more I want to really get back into those grassroots concepts. Mm, yeah, and they're just so relevant. It's, yeah, it's like come through the canon of thousands of years and this, you know, so much richness there to to reapply to our modern concept or modern context for sure and so this topic that we'll be covering today elemental eating does touch on a lot of those things as well it goes back to some of the uh, things that you know it's really hard to actually identify in scientific literature and that is a bit like a constitution or a personality type Is it possible for you to just give us a brief overview of what is elemental eating before we start getting into the nitty gritty? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, my first exposure to this even concept of elemental eating was um, actually as a teenager, I was really into Latino, like magical realism books, like the Gail Garcia Marquez and um, Laura Esquivel and Isabella Lunde, like it's this whole beautiful body of literature where they just describe things with such richness. And there was a book called Pomegranate Soup, and it was going into Zoroastrian. Like one of the, like one of these family members knew these like secrets of the kitchen to like keep the family together, and so that big fights wouldn't roll out. So one of the sisters was very hot headed. And when she was, you know, in one of her moods, she would know to make cucumber yogurt and mint soup for dinner that night. And it would mean that, you know, that would keep the peace in the family. And then, you know, another family member who was very quiet and introverted, you know, when she was getting too much, like too that way, she would, you know, want to make like fiery, passionate dishes. And so then when I was doing my naturopathic training and it was, um, you know, like Indian medicine, Ayurveda and Arabic medicine and Persian medicine had this, you know, there was no, there was a lot of fluidity between food in the home and their medicines. And 
I just loved that concept so much and this idea of your kitchen becoming your apothecary. So I just always had that lens and that antenna up with anything that referenced that through my training and then I've just put a lot of that to practice and find it to be this really beautiful, intuitive um, language to talk to people because we all know what, you know, something that's cold or hot or dry or moist is. So it, instead of talking about in these overly clinical terms. So that's yeah. kind of the overture to it. For sure. And that's really interesting as well, because as you mentioned, there's principles in things like Ayurvedic medicine and even in Chinese medicine as well, because mm. there's a lot of talk about the different sorts of constitutions and, and health patterns that you can have there, where like in Ayurveda, there's the Vata and the Pitta and the Kapha and then the blends of those. And in Chinese medicine, in TCM, there's the different elements, including things like, like metal. But per I haven't really looked into much of Persian medicine before. Mm. Just how, what are some of the differences with that well it's more actually attuned to the western like our western traditional medicine i guess having that similar they stem from like the greek the greek humoral idea of um so humoral meaning that they used to organize their understanding of medicine and health according to hot cold dry and damp or wet um, and so then scholars stayed in Greece and developed those ideas. And that sort of brought us to the age of, um, you know, like Galen, which then really is what we have inherited in our lineage. And then parts of that went off uh, and it really got, you know, through the Arabic system. So their spices and their mixes and all of that in their cuisine is just often really grounded in those concepts. Okay, so that then again translates into what you were saying as well with the kitchen pharmacy where you can actually heal yourself a lot with the food that you're eating and, you know, blend up your own little potions in the kitchen to do that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and that the, the, the kitchen was this, like, invisible force of wellness and, yeah, that and that cookbooks were just as much, like, you know, almost like spell books, but also medical handbooks back at that time. And it was like really herbs and spices that were forming the baseline of all of that. Mm. Mm. You know, I see a lot of these recipes come through and these pictures of inspiration for clean eating and um, low carb eating and all of these other forms of eating that's meant to be health promoting. But the mm. things that get me the excited the most is when you see these herbs and these spices actually putting the flavor into it. And that's what really just drives that healing component. And I think that you can get carried away with counting calories but it's not going to bring you health. It's, it's the nutrients, there's phytonutrients and there's different aspects in there, but also it's the energy of it, isn't it? It's, which is where it comes down into that elemental eating. Um, mm. And we've forgotten all about that. It's something that we probably have done intuitively and you, you said it before, it, it just, it's just remembering, isn't it? Because it's ingrained in us. So... Mm we have to do more intuitive eating in that regard. So let's just talk a little bit about the constitutions and the different sorts of categories that people could fall into to understand then what they need to eat. Yeah, for sure. So I work off, um, so this is very much my remix of taking in lots of different um, traditional systems of medicine. I've just tried to get rid of all the, you know, um, terms that don't necessarily, uh, I mean, like a lot of Ayurvedic terms, when you've been studying it, they become second nature, but for most people, it ends up sounding like you are speaking another language. So I just go off fire, um, water, air, fire, earth, and ether. Ether being the element of space. Um, it's sort of that expansive, the thing that everything is within. So that's often like a, a trickier concept to get your head around. The others are easy. First element, water. Um, so wetness, it is associated with winter. And it is when it's uh, out of balance, like 
as it would show up in the body. It can present in two ways. One is when there's an excess loss of fluids, so excess sweating, um, you know, cases where like for people who just can't, like they just need to go to the bathroom all the time, their like bladders just don't seem to hold on to anything. Um, or it's the opposite where your body is not getting rid of water. So if you become, it's like quite a stagnant state. It's feeling like um, it's like water retention and also the body not being able to release its metabolic byproducts. So that can end up manifesting in quite like a stagnant state. Um, so people who have got like water, you know, a lot of water in their constitution would know that when they're out of sorts or out of balance, they might tend to one of those sort of patterns of imbalance. And with, you know, aligned to all that, it can also be people who are prone to like a lot of mucus. So sort of like sinus issues, if they get sick, the phlegm just seems to stick around for a long time. Um, and they can also, it can also feel like it's difficult to shift weight for these people. It's like that more, um, like clinically, clinically we talk about people who have uh, like lower metabolic rate, whether that's naturally or it's actually been caused by a deeper imbalance. But this is all sort of associated with the water element. It's also the most, if we're talking about yin yang, it's also the most yin element of them all. So it's very, um, it's very introverted and it's a, and it also, I mean, water is a real seat of emotions as well. So, I mean, if you, uh, people, there's a lot of astrological associations with all these elements as well. And it's like the really like the Pisces and, uh, um, difficulty moving fluid out of the body can be these people's sort of Achilles heels. So foods that are really good when you're uh, in this sort of sense of um, when this is out of balance is you want foods that are going to give you structure. So we talk about this, um, it's more like a mouthfeel rather than a flavor, like astringing foods and also foods that can help um, like alter the metabolism, help the body to eliminate wastes. Um, and a herbal term we use for that are alteratives. So, um, I mean, spices that are really wonderful for this is, um, as we were talking about before, an Iranian spice called sumac, which is used a lot with lamb and in rice dishes. And it's um, when you have too much of it, it will make your um, mouth pucker. That's the astringent taste. Or when you leave a cup of tea for too long and the tan a lot of the tannins get extracted. Quite um, pungent. I Pungent slightly different. Pungent like is what like diffuses across the tongue, like mustard or black pepper. This okay. is more like imagine eating a really green banana and it's sort of like, or an unripe uh, apple. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. real puckery. Puckery. Um, yeah. Dry. Almost yeah. sour. Yeah. But it, it sort of, so it pulls tissues together. Um, mm -hmm. And all your alteratives, which are sort of, um, these herbs that can help give the body a hand at eliminating wastes. Um, so things that are really simple that a lot of people would know about in that category are things like nettles and dandelion and violets and chickweed and your red clovers. So yeah, both of those, those elements are really um, helpful when that's about, oh, and also seaweed, seaweeds are fabulous. Oh. Especially if you're losing a lot of fluids and salts, mm. um, electrolytes are really important for these people or if you're in this kind of imbalance. Mm. And then our next element is the element of air. And when that is out of balance, we get a state of dryness. And so that's dryness of the skin, of the membranes. So feeling like constantly thirsty, feeling like you've got a really no, like dry like nose, uh, it can also manifest in like dry, like poppy, creaky joints and also tending towards more um, constipation or difficulty passing stool. Uh, with these, when you're in this state, it's all about nourishment, getting water and oils into the, into the cells. Um, so, I mean, you can get into a state of dryness through like after a period of a lot of um, like pushing yourself too hard 
or just, you know, possibly not nourishing yourself like you normally would. And you're just feeling like a bit withered and um, like we just want to get beautiful nutrients into all those cells. So fluid, of course, is really important here, but also um, tonic oils. So lots of lovely, healthy things like uh, all your omegas, your hemp, your hemp oil, fish oils, um, evening primrose oils. And with your herbs, you want, we've got this beautiful class of herbs called the emollients and the mucilage containing herbs. Um, this is really beautiful, particularly if you are tending towards um, constipation. So these are herbs or plants that when they're exposed to water, they become beautiful and slippery. So these are things like marshmallow root and your slippery elm and flax seeds. And so bringing those into the diet can um, remarkably help with all those symptoms and bring that back into balance. And often I'll, I'll say here, you'll often get these elements in combination. So, you know, you can get that real like dryness from heat in the summer, just, you know, if you've, you know, been exposed to too much sun and your skin's feeling um, like dried up, but also equally if you're in a, you know, a deep winter and in the mountains, that can be incredibly drying as well. Um, so yeah, nutrients, 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 and sweet tonics as well. So a lot of our um, herbs that we love, um, adaptogens. So, you know, your licorices and your American ginseng and Siberian ginseng, like when you taste these, these are all really sweet. Mm -hmm. And the sweet flavor connotes that it's building and nourishing it's why kids love the sweet flavor so much because they're just doing so much building um so yeah that's often a nice thing to talk to people about like sweet foods but naturally sweet foods like your sweet potatoes and putting lots of olive oil on there and yeah and yeah the hot constitutions and the hot and dry constitutions in ayurveda they often recommend putting oil on topically as well as part of their daily practice mm. do you think of yeah. recommend that too yeah, no, for, especially for these kind of people. Mm. Um, yeah, doing and even, even this is so lovely to do is like herbal infused oils. So if you've got like that real dry heat, like you just said, like doing a rose sesame oil is like cooling but nourishing. Mm. Um, if you're tending more to that like cold dry, you might want to put more um, like more like your mugworts or your gingers or sort of those more warming notes to your oil mm. and that would yeah. be a beautiful massage to have in in winter with all of those mm. and doing it before and in Ayurveda they talk a lot about doing that before getting into like a warm bath and it just oh. sounds very luxurious and beautiful doesn't yeah, it yeah that'd be beautiful Mm. Sesame, oil, sesame oil is so nutritive it's so full of antioxidants that'd be such yeah. a lovely thing for someone with dry skin in in my yeah. inner massage classes we recommend sesame oil as being one of the best ones to use because it has got so many yeah. benefits for dry skin and for healing eczema in little bubbies and just provides so many nutrients so it just fits all those categories mm -hmm. that you said of a dry constitution. So just needing needing nutrients and needing that um, soothing. Yes, and I yeah exactly internally and externally. Mm. And I mean, yeah, and I mean I love how you can like dial up and dial dial down this perspective on like little bubs, like a little bub that's got you know eczema. Just like giving like the parents like an idea. Okay, like little one is just in a state of dryness just think about moisturizing and it just it frames things in a nice way I find yeah that's it yeah as opposed mm. to there's a disease state and you get fixated or worried as opposed to getting worried about a specific diagnosis understanding that all humans all people have fluctuations in their health at all times and in their elemental states and so it's bringing you back to balance yeah, that's it. And yeah, and it, like becoming attuned to the environment, like, oh, okay, like if we've got like the heater on or not, you know, if it's like quite a dry environment, like considering all of that mm. as well. Yeah, so yeah. beautiful. So, so after air, we've got the fire, the fiery constitutions. So that's like associated with more when it's out of balance, excess heat and inflammation in the body. And, you know, the season that a lot of us will often experience, you know, at least a little bit of this is, of course, in high summer. And 
something about people who've got that more fiery constitution. I mean, in Ayurveda, they talk about the pitta, pitta constitution. And if you fall into this category, like, you know, the so many great qualities about, you know, a fiery constitution. There's like a lot of focus and determination and action, like fiery constitutions are great at taking action. Um, but if we sort of stay, you know, in that uh, constantly taking action and wearing ourselves out, there can be that, you know, wearing out, you know, too much heat in the body, too much inflammation that's not uh, being cooled and calmed. And in like a health context, like uh, these people are sort of more prone to uh, allergies and, you know, insomnia, which, you know, in an energetic framework is just like too much activity in the entire nervous system and in the body and, you know, things like skin rashes, um, loose stools, that kind of, that kind of thing. And sort of, you can intuitively sort of uh, know what these kind of people need. They need to be cooled down. They need to have that you know, potential irritation and frustration like dissipated and grounded. So ways we can do that with food is emphasizing sour and bitter flavored foods. So things, I mean, and then also just things that are really cooling in nature. So anything green, like cucumbers, melons, yogurt, I mean, the herbs and spices that are brilliant to reach for, uh, like anything like your mints, dill, like dill seed or dill is super cooling and rose I just say like rose everything um when you know you're in like an exacerbated heated state and uh and then things like you know things to pop in your teapot would be things like licorice and chamomile and lavender and lemon balm like it's just about that yeah creating a cool and calm environment for these people when they're a bit out of sorts and it's also super important um something I love to tell my fiery constitutional, you know, clients is uh, taking time to rest, reset and recharge is super important. So yeah, that's, yes. that's fire. <laughs> yeah. But those all sound like delicious foods. And I, I love the idea of including roses into your diet, something that so many people wouldn't think to do. Mm, I know. Well, actually, so fire is my very much my constitution. And I used to live up in northern New South Wales, which is like a very hot, hot climate. When I first moved there, I didn't quite know how I was going to get through my degree because that's where I went to train. And I discovered getting a coconut, um, like a fresh coconut, and I'd put a nip of rose water in there and some mint leaves and lemon balm, balm leaves from my garden, and that cooled me down like nothing else. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, and then the electrolytes in the coconut water, it was just, yeah, it was like my special yeah. cool and calm down remedy. And even, you know, speaking of like, you know, people going through that menopausal transition can often get like, you know, these exacerbated heated states and keeping a spritzer of rose water in your bag when, you know, a hot flush comes past is such a lovely thing to do as well. Mm. And I love that you Mm. said that because it really opens up that discussion of how many conditions have a heat element to it, but like going even beyond a constitution, beyond the person, there are things that can alter you that you want to be driving down that heat. So using that sort of spritzer would be really good for all sorts of hot heated conditions. Mm, yeah, especially hot overheated little children too. That can be a nice one. Lovely. <laughs> to cool, yeah, to cool them down. And yeah, so that's beautiful. So, yeah. And then... Do you recommend um, more raw or cold foods for these constitutions? Yeah, if you're like if you are a very fiery um, temperament, then you're the you, you are a constitution that's going to be able to handle more raw food than other constitutions. Mm. And, yeah, and if you're in a really imbalanced state of too much fire, then yes, lending towards rawness is helpful there. Yeah, so something like a you know a, a cucumber soup, or as you were talking about before, like a raita with like yogurt and cucumber in it might be might be a nice option with some mint and, and dill throughout mm. it, mm. and like your gazpachos. And for some people, like that might be handy to have a little fire remedy in the cupboard. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, like 
if you've got a significant other or somebody in your family who's like a fiery, like do not serve curry if they're a bit out of sorts. Yeah. So yeah. you know that old um, saying of having a curry or having something spicy would cool you down because it makes it sweat. Does that go a little bit against this concept? No, 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 no. That is true, actually. I mean, but that gets like a little bit more into the like deeper I mean, I forget the term. It's like a Sanskrit term, but they talk about plants having a primary action and a secondary action. Yep. So something like chili has a primary action of heat, but it heats so much that it opens up the peripheries, like so the sweat glands, so then you sweat and then you cool down. Mm. So then it's got a secondary cooling effect. Something like turmeric is really heating, but it cools down inflammation. Um, so herbs are just working in these beautiful dynamic ways all the time aren't they so it's (laughs) so this is where like the instinct with it comes in but yeah to an extent having chili just to break the heat to sort of rebalance the constitution can be helpful almost like pressing the reset button yeah exactly exactly (laughs) kind of like how people go for like those ice you know ice swimming in the winter and it really like invigorates their whole system and makes them quite resilient yeah I have not brought myself to do that. I know there's a lot of research behind those being beneficial at the moment, but yeah, I'm just so much of a wuss. I think that I might be a little bit on the colder constitution. So yeah, that's probably so not the, for the middle of summer for you to play around with that idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you were talking about how where you are has a bit of an impact too. So mm. I guess even though you might find that you are a certain constitution or a type, you're always going to have different experiences within these as well. So you're not always going to be a a wet type or a dry type or a hot type or um, or something like that because you might go travelling and you go, okay, like I'm actually expressing a little bit more of that. So that's that's really um, good to know too. Yeah, exactly. We've, sort of, we've got like our we've got to like our base note, and then everything can be like iterated on there. Mm. Okay, mm. that's fire. Yeah, so that's heat. Yeah. That's fire, and then yeah, and then we move on to the opposite of that, which is earth, and co- like coldness is associated with earth. So this is like instead of a over function, like oh, too much expression, this is like a depression of function. Everything's like a bit of a lowered activity. There's like an understimulation uh, going on. And like us, you know, clinicians, when we see people like that, we're often be thinking about like, okay, we're thinking about they've probably got sluggish circulation or, you know, always thinking about like, okay, how's their thyroid doing? So thyroid, you know, our thyroids govern, you know, the thermostat in our, in our bodies. And often if we're tending towards always coldness, uh, that would lend to some of those things, but there's like plenty of things you can do just in your home that can help just warm up the body. But I mean, when you're out of balance and you're really in that cold state, it's, you know, everything is slow. So, you know, feeling like a low mood, feeling fatigued, potentially like slower bowels, like so tending towards more constipation, cold hands and feet, um, maybe even like a blue or purple tinge to them just again all that sort of poor circulation stuff uh and often also like brain fog uh if you know too much with our fiery people they can get maybe a bit hyper focused or over focused whereas if you're in that cold state it's just hard to get everything sparking and going uh and so and we often feel this in the depths of winter don't we like it's like oh i just am feeling like slow and just want everything to spark back up again Mm. so what we want here is our like aromatics and our warming foods so like I mean basically a nice way to just distill it in a simple way is chai spices oh yeah put in a chai pot so I mean what do you like to put in your chai um I I tend to have a ready-made one, but I particularly like cinnamon and cardamom. Mm, mm. Um, like they're the flavours that stand out to me and a little bit of clove yeah. is always really good. <laughs> yeah, clove always gets things moving. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, and your nutmegs and black peppers and 
What I've, else have we got? I think I've got a bit of a, a, a kapha. Um, I, I tend to fluctuate between a few of them, but I have mm. a little bit of kapha, a little bit of pitta. And um, I think the things that I tend to quite like is rosemary and um, chili and like things that are going to be like quite mm. stimulating. Yeah, as so well. then any of those Mediterranean herbs too. Yeah, you so yes. rosemaries and bay leaves and mm. sage and oregano, those are all super heating. And yeah. I mean, another thing like about a cold state is that there's that, um, uh, there can be that predilection to like getting infections easily, like picking up colds and flus and like having, you know, using all those spices and herbs liberally in your food is such a good way to keep, you know, all those bugs at bay. Mm. Mm. And, you mm. know, I guess like my understanding of it is that if you're of a different constitution it's not that you have to avoid those spices it's more so that they are of particular benefit to other types would that sound right sorry it just it just a little robot move on me oh no um so i just oh, no. uh, what i was saying is that um the the feeling that i get is that sometimes it's not that we have to avoid these spices or foods if you are of a different constitution, but just that they are of particular benefit for that particular constitution that we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. And I think totally, totally, totally. Yeah. It's definitely not creating like, oh, you've got a hot constitution, so avoid all heating spices. Yeah. It's more like if you are hot, if you are a hot constitution and it's in the middle of summer, like you're probably going to enjoy that coconut water with the rose water more than you were going for a really hot steaming like cup of chai. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, vice versa, if you're that cold constitution. Mm. So I guess like the real guiding principle of all of this is just like, um, becoming that, like, you know, awakening that kitchen witch of like, if you're feeling really out of balance, you've just got this really cool set of principles to draw upon to bring you back into balance rather than this becoming like another rule book of how to like structure, you know, your health and well-being. Yeah. Like do this and don't do that. It's more about like, yeah, you have exactly. And I love that term kitchen witch. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah. I talk, that's actually become quite a part of my vocabulary these days, actually. Oh, I think beautiful. we all have an inner kitchen, witch that lacks to be ev evoked. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then we put our final our final element um which is one that potentially doesn't get used as much when I talk about this often it makes complete sense to people but it's like something that hasn't been heard as much um at least yeah. in the western idea I admit it's not one that is in my line of thinking about constitutions but I'm so excited to hear what you have to mm. say about it yeah, so, I mean, ether is the element of space. So, like, literally just spaciousness. So, like, beyond the earth, you know, expands. And so when there is a lack of space in the body, we have tension. And in the Ayurvedic constitutions, like, vata is part uh, cold, part ether. And that really differentiates them from a kapha type, which is part cold, part, uh, part earth. So with that ether element, you know, that can just be that uh, internal tension. It can be that state of like getting cramps and spasms. And, you know, I, I feel like it's actually like a pretty, you know, if you live in a city that's really busy, you, we're quite predisposed to have an imbalance of this element. Um, yeah, because it's just all about the nervous system ticking over and when it's, you know, has been maybe working a little bit too hard over time so yeah. I, I mean a really and this yeah and this is just it's equally about like psychological tension as it is physical tension with this element it makes so much sense when you do say it and I remember um, Dennis Stewart who's a, like a herbalist he says that we're becoming a vatagenic society and I guess that's because Vata is like, you know, high strung and anxious. But when the way that you're talking about constitutions is like a lot more broader than just the, like the Ayurvedic constitutions that you've got all of these other things in there. And so ether makes mm. so much more sense because that's, that's probably more what's going on than, than what, what we just said. Yeah. It's, I mean, I don't know about you. I just feel like everyone I speak to, we've, 
we, there's like this chronic sense of like lack of time, lack of space, lack of like, you know, everything's feeling pressured and we sort of got like yeah. kind of being contained from all angles. Yeah, I definitely resonate with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think Dennis Stewart's right on the money. I, think I see. I think, yeah, most people have got a bit of a ether imbalance going on. Um, yeah, mate, that's why holidays are really good. <laughs> that's like open into space. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I mean, so there's like plenty of like, I mean, the way to balance this element, I mean, mostly is like doing your best to slow down and like the breath. You know, ether is very much associated with our breath. And if we can, you know, pranayama is so good for bringing ourselves, you know, into balance with this element. And I often see, you know, people who've got that very ethery constitution. They're the people that often really love, like, smoking is potentially more the thing that, you know, is the thing that they like can yeah. calm them down. Interesting. And that I've seen that, yeah, I've seen that correlation quite a bit just because that breathing is just a calming exercise to do and being able to focus on that. So, you know, so instead of like tobacco, just get, taking a moment to do, you know, it's like a simple deep breathing or you can get a bit fancy with some, yeah, yogic stuff. It's like a really quick one to do. Yeah, there's um, so many different techniques, isn't there? But it's also powerful. Mm, but what I like about this elemental way of thinking about it is like, you know, whether it's like working like as a practitioner, trying to work out like a really nice self-care toolkit to, you know, be creating, co-creating with a client or if you're creating your own self-care, uh, knowing what's going to bring that constitution into balance is really cool. So with like a cold earth person, if, you know, they're in a state of like mental upset or feeling a bit out of sorts, you know, their solution might be like go out into the sun and walk and call a friend or a loved one versus somebody who's in that E3, you know, tense, tense state. It's like go to a yoga class and make sure there's plenty of pranayama in there and just like do what you need to do to feel that space in your body and in your, in, you know, in your inner world. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense so much sense like I know that I often feel so much more relaxed when I you know just go outside and just sit on the ground yeah exactly <laughs> get in touch take with your shoes off yeah, yeah. Get the grounding and, you know yeah grounding get yeah like aligning yourself with that element that you've got that you know deep constitutional affinity with and you know I mean, it all sounds like, you know, all like kind of poetic, but where I find this comes into its own is in this wellness landscape we're in at the moment, where there's just so much information and so many lists of things that you can do to self-treat. And, you know, but when you overlay it with an elemental framework, things just come into place for where you are in that moment a lot more elegantly and precisely. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's also just things that you can just be more empowered about doing as well, rather than feeling like the answer is always external. Yeah. Or that the answer is like, it's because my serotonin is low and there's like a, I'm having like an inflamed reaction to gluten. And I can imagine the like inflammatory compounds circulating around my body, you know, like I feel like we're falling into a little bit of that, like of that thinking as a culture versus like, Oh, okay. Like, fire element is out of like a bit out of balance like I'm yeah. just gonna have some like cooling foods and downtime yeah and like yes yeah, so yeah. like, maybe gluten is causing some inflammation but you don't have to think about it like that because then you tend to get that sort of mind overload and you don't you don't have to get into the nitty-gritty of it that's you know that's the job of a practitioner to really work out those kinks for you but even they all all this constitutional stuff it actually is so powerful isn't it and yeah gluten might be a factor but it still comes down to that base level of doing what's right for you yeah exactly and just yeah reframing it to be like what is most nourishing to me what is like yeah and then knowing those triggers and yeah but, but without like having to shoulder the burden of trying to work out what it is when you haven't had the training for that and everything can feel like a bit scary so coming back to the language of our ancestors and the elements I feel is just such a refreshing way to frame it for yourself 
So it sounds a lot like with ether, there is a lot of things that you can do lifestyle wise, like stretching and breathing. Is there any mm. foods that you often find more beneficial? Yeah. So anything rich in minerals and electrolytes, really like, and like all those magnesium rich foods, because all those minerals is what our nervous system and our muscles need to contract and relax smoothly. So that can be like, that can be getting yourself some really beautiful quality salt, like a Himalayan salt or Celtic salts or black river salt, like whatever it is, like you, you want, like not a table salt and doing, you know, something like with like avocado on like a toast of your choice with like a nice heavy helping of that, like good quality salt. Um, or like I mentioned before, like the coconut water or anything that's got a lot of those trace minerals or seaweeds, uh, is really helpful and then anything green like you know like anything green equals magnesium um that's a great way to remember it basically mm. yeah <laughs> i I'll, I'll spare maybe your listeners of going into the, the geeks geeky things of chlorophyll versus hemoglobin oh. but it's <laughs> it's a nice easy um uh, simple way to to look at it but yeah like yeah you know and, and taking an actual magnesium supplement if you are in that really ethery state, you know, really tense in your body, really feeling tense and stressed in your mind is, you know, such, such a simple nutrient that can have such like profound impacts quickly. Mm. Kind of. Yeah, for sure. I love magnesium and it has just such a broad range of actions, but very powerful. Mm, yeah. Again, I think it's so popular now because we are all a bit in this, a bit in this state. <laughs> For sure. And then, yeah, and then just a few other things that are really nice for um, our ether people is like warm, salty baths, like having a nice like Epsom salt bath with like not just like a little half cup of Epsom salts, like putting in like a good two cups and maybe really? even doing like a salt scrub with a nice oh. oil beforehand is yeah. gorgeous to do. Mm. that sounds great and I've, I've heard of salt scrubs being part of a daily ritual being really helpful as a protective thing too um like quite a nice sort of way to you know shed off negative energies and so doing that in the shower could be quite good yeah there's something about salt isn't it like mm. whenever I have a really salty bath it's yeah it's guaranteed a very deep sleep it's pretty pretty awesome yeah. So I guess um, that sounds like a really great review of all of the different constitutions, but finding out or working out for a person how to actually navigate the foods around there, that takes a little bit of the next step, doesn't it? And so what I would love to, for you to talk about now is how people can eat intuitively. Yeah. So, uh, so the space of intuitive eating is something that I've just discovered recently in the last 12 months. Um, but I really feel like it is just such a missing link or f like, or a final link actually. Uh, so, I mean, it's basically the principle or reframing the way that you nourish yourself of like aligning your body's needs with, you know, with your like spirit and your heart really, and allowing yourself, like allowing ourselves to like rely on our instincts rather than trying to work out what we need from our head all the time. Um, so it's a philosophy that really helps us move away from like rigid external rules against around like what's good or bad, like what's clean, what's toxic, you know, all these kind of words that, are, uh, you know, setting up this black and white, which, you know, it can, it, it can be really easy to get into that thinking, especially if you have had food triggers or, you know, changing your diet has actually made a big impact on your healing. Um, and so I just found myself as a naturopath, like wondering, I was doing a lot of good with pe putting people on therapeutic food plans, but I was beginning to notice people getting maybe a little bit mentally stressed about it, uh, or becoming a bit mentally rigid about it and it impacting other areas of their life. Um, so even though their gut was all better and their skin problem had cleared up or their periods were now back on track, you know, there was this sometimes there was this other element and I have found, you know, this framework has really 
helped to navigate that and put a really nice set of principles for people to work with to do that final step. Yeah, I love that that idea because I see it too that people are so afraid of stepping backwards in their health and, mm. and you know, you've got some results in whatever you've prescribed a particular diet for, but it's then the next step, that's that real scary area. And, yeah, you don't, you don't want to cause no, stress with the diet, don't. do you? It's like, so the last thing you want to do. Mm. And, <laughs> and we, of course, want to leave our, you know, our patients, you know, far better off than before they came and, you know, saw us. I, um, I mean, it's, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, but I, you know, orthorexia is that term mm. for, that's, you know, I, I, I believe it's now, I think just recently the DSM, which is like that official psychological framework for making diagnoses has, you know, it's been recognized as an actual diagnosis and it's just the obsession of healthy eating. And yeah, and I think, uh, you know, us practitioners in the holistic space have got a great responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, so how this links with elemental framework is that it's all about, it's all about senses, right? Like instinct and intuition and coming into like learning to listen to our body and then being able to honor its needs rather than, you know, doing what we think our body needs and then obeying the rules. You know, there's quite a distinction between those two ways of approaching our wellness. Yeah, and you know there has to be a caveat here because you know for some people who have got uh, like celiac disease or they truly do have you know a, a reaction to a food like that's different you know that's in a different category here um, or if you know that there's been like a food trigger and that you know that's really taking that food out is really what's allowed you to um, gain traction on your health but if it's more that um, you know, you feel better off those foods. It's sort of working out what is the new, like what is that new terrain? Like how is it about an amount of it that actually is it a threshold thing? And so then just taking away this idea of, you know, restriction and a binary model of like, oh, no, I can't have that ever to being like, no, I I'm not having that food right now because I know it doesn't make me feel good, but maybe it will one day. So just like being a bit more fluid about it all. And yeah, I mean, really the essence of it is coming away from rigidity and just coming into what feels nourishing for you right now. Mm. It's almost a bit more compassionate to yourself as well, isn't it? Oh, 100%. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's love and compassion. Like, that's that's yeah you hit the nail on the head because yeah. I mean I I'm sure do you find this in your practice like uh I mean as a culture we've have we have so many crazy ideas around food you know <laughs> and when you start disentangling what people have absorbed over the years um yeah I I've, I've seen many different things of it and bless but um it can you can find that things can get taken a little out of hand. And I probably have seen it less in my patients than just observing things on sure of it um, because like that's where you tend to see people who get the, the fad diet going on and are, and are preaching it um, to other people, isn't it? So one of the things that I imagine you get asked quite a lot when you're recommending intuitive eating is that does this just mean that, you know, I feel like chocolate cake, so therefore I want chocolate cake and that's good for me and that sort of thing. Like, does that mean people are going to be It's such a good cravings? question. And um, well, it's one that you can sort of look at it in a few ways. I mean, so one of them is in the beginning when, you know, taking on an intuitive eating approach with clients, like often I'll say to them, like, look, you know, there'll be a learning period here and it might feel a bit unstable at the beginning. And I forget who said it, somebody who's one of the sort of, leaders in this intuitive eating movement about how it's like a pendulum swinging from diet land to donut land <laughs> and when you you know if you've been in a restricted mindset for a long time when you when you open when you like release the structures it can be easy to like you know swing all the way over to back to that other side but it's actually about you know trusting in the process and allowing that pendulum to find its middle ground of where it's happy uh, so that's one part of it. And just to anticipate, you know, 
And I mean, the whole thing is then like, okay, eat all the chocolate cake and Mm -hmm. maybe you won't feel so great after it. (laughs) And so like, you know, feel into that, like, because all of this is about making you feel good. Uh, And then the other side of it is if there is, you know, some kind of, if food is being used as an emotional crutch, if it is, you know, it is something that is reached for if, you know, feeling sad or, you know, or vulnerable or whatever it may be, then, you know, having that compassion with yourself to just see that as a really great signpost, like, oh, okay, when I am really, you know, reaching for comfort food or volumes of food, or, you know, it might be, I don't want to eat because I'm feeling X, Y, and Z. Like that gives you a really clear insight into your, how you're feeling. And if you're, you know, working with the guidance and the support of the practitioner, that can give you some really nice insights that will help you on ultimately that healing journey and coming to peace with food and, you know, ultimately, you know, functioning at a, you know, happy, optimal level. So it's, it's, so it yeah again it just comes back to compassion and a lot of trust as well I feel I, mean, yeah. I have the trust conversation a lot with people around this yeah that's re- that's really interesting point but such a mm. good one yeah I, I love that idea yeah, and, and then I, oh and just I mean the final like the final kind of bow that ties all of this together is uh this concept of, and it's like the final principle in intuitive eating is gentle nutrition. And it's like, okay, take that information about what we know constitutes a great, you know, like great balance of nourishment. Take what you know about what foods like can like alarm your system and what foods you find really calming and nourishing and use that as your framework and allow yourself to move within it and experiment within it. And, you know, if you've got that map of the elements and elemental eating, if you've got that sense of trust in your body and trust of just like allowing yourself to enjoy your food and allow yourself to desire, allow yourself to, you know, it just, it brings all your senses back online that's with this part of your well-being. So mm-hmm. that's why I just love it as a, as a, you know, as a framework to work in. I think that sounds amazing and I'm imagining that if you've got a strict diet in front of you, it's like you're going on a highway and you're going somewhere in a straight line and it's not particularly interesting whereas you've got, Mm. like you said, it's like a map of um, an area that you can work within and then you go on this little adventure with your diet and you get to explore a little bit of an area that is a bit scary or not very comfortable, but then you get to see all these amazing areas of the world that are just so good for you and fun and delicious. <laughs> exactly. So it makes, makes your eating exactly. life a bit of an adventure. Love totally. it. Totally. Yeah. And it's like you've got a terrain also, to explore and here's a map. Mm. And I love the way mm. that it all comes down to knowing yourself and um, knowing knowing what your constitution is and then no, knowing what tools you can do for yourself and then having, like you said, that trust and that love and compassion for yourself and get, having the tools to do all those things with food but also with your, with your lifestyle as well. Exactly. Yeah. You've, yeah. Yeah, no, I couldn't have said it better myself. Mm. If people would like to know more about all of these sorts of content, where can they go to get more information on this? So I really recommend, I mean, the, in terms of the intuitive eating, uh, I really recommend the work of Evelyn Triboli and Elise Rich. Um, they're the ones that wrote the, the sort of the seminal book. They've pioneered this area uh, and they've got, you know, they've got the book and they've got like a workbook with like a 10 week kind of journaling self-inquiry process. Uh, so I would really recommend that. I would also really recommend the work of Laura Thomas, who is a dietitian in the UK, and she's just really fun and makes all of this really accessible. And she's written a book called Just Eat It, which released um, last year. So uh, she's a really great one too. Um, she probably makes it like a bit more accessible to the millennial generation, I feel. And then in terms of elemental eating, um, Maya Tawari, that's M-A-Y-A-T-I-W-A-R-E. She does such a beautiful job with the Ayurvedic side, but she, she breaks it down into these elemental principles as well. 
and her work is very beautiful and in depth and mm -hmm. she has like shopping lists and things that you could keep on your fridge that gives you those elemental frameworks so if you oh. would get some of those that would have you well set up okay well i'll pop the links for those in in the show notes perfect thank you thank you so much what a pleasure oh, my it's pleasure been. Alison it's been <laughs> wonderful <laughs> if people would like to get in contact with you how can they do that um so if you if you wanted to join my email community I write a fortnightly newsletter on all these kind of subjects uh, you can go to mediatrixwellness.com.au and there's um, you'll be able to find a spot to sign up for with that and I also hang out on Instagram a bit. So I'm Clara Bailey double underscore over there. Awesome. And you do have a beautiful Instagram and you share oh, so much wonderful, valuable content. So I definitely recommend everyone go and check it out. So thank you so much again for all, sharing all your wonderful information. It's been such a lovely time chatting with yes, you. Yes, likewise. And thank you everyone. <laughs> thank you, Alison. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a pleasure. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. If you've enjoyed today, please go on and leave us a review. And if you have anything you'd like to hear about in the future, please don't hesitate to ask. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>